Good afternoon. Uh, welcome very much to this afternoon session of uh, LCA 2018 in Sydney. We all hope you've been enjoying your time thus far. And it is my great pleasure to announce to you blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> now, Thank you. For, for those of you who were in at LCA last year, this is Rusty Russell. He uh, currently works for Blockstream out of Adelaide and is here to talk to us today about future technology dire technological directions in Bitcoin. Rusty, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Oh. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, uh, the shirt moved to reveal the logo. Can you take the logo? Caused me a gross failure. Right, okay. <laughs> nope, one more. <laughs> Well-polished machine that we are. There we go. Excellent. OK. Um, let's try that again. Thank you for that introduction. Um, my talk today is going to be all about this. And I'm not going to be talking at all about this, of which there is plenty on the internet. So if you ask a question, you see me reaching for the red hat, please stop me. OK. Before I begin, I want to apologize in advance. This talk is a summary of things coming up in Bitcoin and things that people are working on. So first, I need to apologize to the people whose work I'm trying to compress into about 85 seconds each, um, because I'm going to gloss over a lot of things. Sometimes there's asterisks to note that I'm glossing over things, and sometimes there isn't. So I want to apologize for all their hard work, particularly having to choose a subset of development and figure out what I thought was the most interesting. So I apologize in advance to them. But I also apologize in advance to you, because this is going to be a whirlwind tour. It's going to feel a little bit like 23 lightning talks, sorry, 24 lightning talks back to back in quick succession. And I'm only going to give you a vague taste of things, and you have to dig in later. And hopefully, I can convey some of the essential excitement um, as we go. I believe everyone talking about cryptocurrencies should disclose their holdings. In my case, Bitcoin, fairly straightforward. OK. First, we're going to go through a Bitcoin keyword primer. This is basically not enough Bitcoin to do anything useful, but it does mean that you know a few keywords and you can sound like you know what you're talking about. Then we're going to go through two kinds of proposed improvements. The first being consensus improvements, changes to the blockchain itself, transactions and blocks. In particular, we're talking about backwards compatible changes. And for then we're going to talk about non-consensus changes, like changes the way peers talk to each other that don't involve changing the, the, uh, the blockchain format. I'm not going to be talking today at all, for lack of time, about anything built on top of Bitcoin, layer two. And I'm not going to be talking about hard forks, incompatible changes to Bitcoin. So here becomes a very quick four minute keyword primer. This is a Bitcoin transaction. It contains outputs, TXOs. Each output has an amount, and an output script. Now that output script basically is a very simple stack-based scripting language with no loops uh, that validates who can spend this output. Here's another transaction spending it, and you can see that transaction has an input. In particular, it has an input script. In this case, it's a key and the signature of that key. When you evaluate that and then the output script, it leaves true on the stack, meaning it's valid and therefore that transaction is valid. Now, the other term that we need to come across is TXID. This is the hash of the entire transaction. Very simple. Transactions are built up into chains like this. In particular, I want you to note that of the 19 outputs there, six of them remain unspent. We call this the unspent transaction output set, the UTXO set. And that's important because to validate a new transaction, it needs to spend one of those. So that is the set of things you need to know to check a new transaction. Bitcoin, of course, is a blockchain, like just about everything else. And that means that a Bitcoin block contains the hash of the previous block, causing it to be a chain. And it also contains a heap of transactions. You can see down the bottom here. Now, the way the transactions are put into the Bitcoin block is kind of interesting. The TXID, as I said, is already a hash of the transaction itself. And what we do is we take pairs of TXIDs, hash those hashes together to form another hash, and we build up a tree. And we put the root of the tree 
in the Bitcoin block header. Now that kind of hash tree is called a Merkle tree. Cool thing about a Merkle tree is I can prove to you that this transaction is in that Merkle tree. So if you've got the block header, I can prove it's in the block. But all, because all I have to give you is the TX ID of its neighbor and the hash of the other side of the tree, you can combine the hashes yourself and check that it matches the Merkle root. If it does, you know that transaction's in the block. That is all I'm gonna tell you about Bitcoin, except the bits that I have to scatter along the way to talk about improvements. So let's talk about our first set of improvements that have been that are proposed in research. And these are soft forks. So a soft fork is a backwards compatible change, so old nodes will still work. Um, and the rule with a soft fork is basically that you can make things that are currently legal illegal, but you can't make things that are currently illegal legal, because that would break compatibility. Now as a warm up, I'm gonna talk about a soft fork that happened in August last year called Segregated Witness. And this addressed the problem of script upgradability UTXO bloat and unwanted malleability. Let's talk about what it actually is. Well, it's a new output script type, and the output script is literally just a version and then a hash. And for version zero, it's either a 20-byte hash, which is the hash of a public key, or a 32-byte, which is a hash of a script. Now, the input which would normally spend this is empty. And the real input stuff goes in something called the witness. And the witness contains the input stack and that key or hash, uh, sorry, key or script, which we promised in the output. And you can check, yes, indeed, that's the right one, because it hashes correctly. Okay. So here's our old style transaction. Remember our TX ID is the hash of the whole thing. If it was a segregated witness transaction, the input script would be empty, and this new witness thing would actually contain the pub key and the, the signature, for example. Now, as you'll notice, that is no longer hashed into the transaction ID. It has been segregated out of the transaction ID. And that turns out to be really important because there are potentially a whole heap of different input scripts that can satisfy those output conditions. In particular, you can sign it again and you can change, there's actually a way of third parties changing signatures to invert them, to make them still valid and still work, but they completely change the transaction ID. This is called transaction malleability. And malleate actually is an obsolete word meaning to hit with a hammer. So I imagine somebody out there whacking transactions with a hammer to change their transaction ID. So this helps several things. We've seen that version byte. You saw that it had a version zero. Everything else above version one and above is given a free pass at the moment for future changes. It helps layer two, because if you're building things on top of Bitcoin, you can now rely on the fact that the transaction IDs don't change. So if you've got a chain of transactions, somebody can't break the chain by malleating um, in an unwanted manner. It also helps hardware wallets because of a check sig change. But importantly, it helps bloat incentives and throughput. Without segregated witness, it's actually cheaper to create a new output than it is to spend an existing one. And that creates incentive to create more UTXOs, which everyone has to remember. Now, what they chose with this witness, because it's outside the old rules, it's a separate segregated thing, is to not count it the same way. The rules say you can't have more than a million bytes in a block of transactions. They chose the witnesses, which don't appear under those rules, to count as a quarter of a byte each. Effectively meaning that you can fit more in a block. But in particular what it means is that it's now almost as cheap to spend an output as it is to create a new one. So hopefully the incentives are much more aligned with what we want. And also of course because about 60% of the block is in fact input stack of witnesses, um, this is a significant throughput increase for Bitcoin. Instead of a meg block, we end up around about, in theory, up to four meg, but in practice, probably around two to 2.3 uh, megabyte blocks. Now that's in the past. The first of the proposals of the things that, oh, we've lost the counter on the bottom, that's okay. The first of the things that um, I wanna talk about in the future is we have this problem. We have this new output format, but we have no address for it. The original Bitcoin addresses are base 58, a nice round number, with a 32-bit truncated SHA-256 checksum, and they look like, this is my vanity address, by the way, don't send money. Um, the new ones are base 32, with a 30-bit BCH checksum. And in fact, from PeterWoolerFacts.com, this apparently is the name of Peter Wooler's dog. Uh, so, here's Willy Woo. Um, now, the BEC32 code is guaranteed to detect up to four errors. Guaranteed that checksum will not pass if you make four or fewer errors, 
And similar letter substitution, A, E, Q, P, X, K kind of things, um, it will detect up to five of those kind of errors. And if you have more than that errors, it still has a one in a billion chance of falsely giving you the, uh, falsely okaying uh, the result. The effect is that this is actually a much stronger checksum than the old 32-bit checksum that we had. So this helps address readability. Base32 obviously is case insensitive, which is nicer. It fits better on QR codes and it's error prevention. And that's something that we're seeing rolled out now. On the bottom of the screen is my future meter. It's incredibly unreliable. But um, in this case, I think it's pretty good. We're going to see that coming out very, very soon. It's exponential, by the way. OK, next thing, MAST. This solves the problem of really large scripts. So MAST stands for Merkleized Abstract Syntax Trees. And when Bitcoiners talk about this, what they're really talking about is turning a script into a Merkle tree of scripts. So then, in order to spend it, you provide one of the scripts and one of those hash proofs, all the neighbors, neighbor hash, to prove that it's in the tree. So before, we might have had a complex script like this. It can be spent two ways. Either I can spend it after 144 blocks, or you can spend it with your key. And currently, if you wanted to create this kind of thing, you would have a zero for version zero segwit, and then you would have the hash of that script, and that would be your output script. Bit 114 basically would break those two, create a Merkle tree out of them, which is a trivial Merkle tree with only two leaves, and then you would commit version one they're proposing. Version one segwit script would be, and here's my Merkle root. And then to spend it, you would provide the script and you provide the proof that it was in the Merkle tree and it has a version field as well. It's actually more complicated than that, hence the asterisk, but okay. But BIP114 is not the only game in town. There is a separate proposal or pair of proposals called 116 and 117. And 116 adds a new opcode called op, tree, op Merkle tree verify. And that takes the three things on the stack, which is basically the, the script, the proof, and the Merkle root, and checks indeed that that script, status with the proof, is indeed in the Merkle tree. Okay. But that doesn't actually get you masked. That just gets you a check. So what 117 does is add a new rule that says any crap you've left on the stack after valid execution is popped off the stack and executed in a kind of a tail recursive fashion. So you can use 116 to prove, yes, this is in the Merkle tree, and use 117 after you leave it on the stack to actually execute it. Now, there are some issues with this, but I still expect this, this, this to happen in the next year or so. Um, now, in addition to size, it also provides privacy for those unused branches. If there's an exceptional case, which is the norm, you normally have a, this is what I expect to happen, but just in case, here's a whole other set of conditions. That whole other set that doesn't happen you just summarize with a hash. You don't need to reveal that on chain. You don't need to reveal the fact that your backup plan involves a three of five check multi-sig and everything else. So that's kind of nice. There is, however, a problem with this. this. Both of these styles make it very, very obvious what you're doing. You're doing a mast payment. Um, <laughs> but there is a proposal called Taproot, which is what, this is why you take, check Twitter during talks. Um, and it uses a new style of pay to pub key hash. And you can, and the users, when they're setting this up, use a base key and the hash of a script that they want the alternate alternative to be. And they use that to make a new key. And then they just say, use this new thing and pay to that key. And you can either spend it like before, you know, take the key, key produce the signature, all good, or you can reveal the base key and the script, and if that has indeed created the key they expect, it will actually execute the script for you. So in the common case, it looks exactly like a normal pay to pub key hash. You can't tell that this key was built out of a base key and everything else it just looks like a key. It's all good. But in the exceptional case, you provide those components and you can do mast. So that potentially overrides everything I said about the rest of mast coming really soon because this proposal looks really, really awesome. But this one doesn't have any code. So Another problem in the Bitcoin space is these keys and signatures. In particular, there are a lot of cases where you have multi-signatures and you have to have a key for each signer. So if we have this deal where you and I both have to sign off to spend something, it would look something like this. We both provide a signature that we generated from our key and we both provide our keys and we use object multi-sig. There are, however, I would simpler, in fact, um, signature schemes like the Schnorr signature scheme 
which allow you to combine keys. So you and I have a key, we add them together. You and I produce a signature, we add them together. And those added, the added keys and added signatures are a valid key and signature themselves. Now this is actually really cool because our example from before where we had all these keys and signatures collapses down to single key, single signature and some op check sig two. I made that name up and I'm terrible at naming so I guarantee it won't be called that. Now the cool thing about this whoop, is that it's smaller, obviously. Smaller transactions are cheaper. But also, it's more fungible. You can't tell the difference between this kind of multi-sig and a normal signature spend again, which is a very nice property to have. But we still have one signature for every one of those inputs in a transaction. It turns out with these signature aggregations, with these signature schemes, you can do signature aggregation. And it might look something like this. Say if we have a check ag sig operator that we add of code, um, you provide a sig and a key, but after the first signature, you just provide an empty signature. You say, it was referred to the one above. And ch check ag sig would never actually fail, but when you get to the end of the transaction, it would add up all the signatures you said to check and check that it was indeed the one that you gave it. And if it wasn't, fail the transaction. Now this is obviously helps input size again, one signature is all great, and validation speed. You don't have to check one signature per input, you check one signature per transaction, fantastic. But it also provides incentive to combine transactions. There's a protocol called CoinJoin, where two people who don't trust each other can negotiate to combine the things they want to spend into one mega transaction. And by two, I mean any number. So we can all combine to produce a, a massive transaction. Now there's now an incentive to do this because there's only one signature per transaction, so that's actually smaller, significantly smaller, than having two separate transactions. So this does provide a CoinJoin incentive. Okay. It also turns out there are still a lot of signatures to check in every block. But these signatures are actually amenable to a kind of a batch validation mode, where you do some prep work and then you basically check all of them at once. And that scales super linearly. So it's much faster checking 10,000 than it is checking at once than checking 10,000 individuals. The downside is that all you get is an answer going, they were all good or something went wrong. But when you're checking a whole block, that's all you care about. In practice, this doesn't actually help with block validation. Because usually when you get a block, you've seen all the transactions that are floating around the network before that have been put in the block. And you've checked them presumably as you were going. So you've just cached it all. But it really does help with initial block download validation speed. Okay. How are we going so far? Should we take a five second break? Okay, let's go. Scriptless scripts. This problem is the scripts are sometimes unnecessary. And this comes out of a project called Mimblewimble, which is awesome. And I, if you ever want to be deeply amused, find out the origins of the Mimblewimble project, but I have no time to talk about it now. So it turns out that scripts are sometimes unnecessary. But it's, to give you an example, I'm going to talk about atomic swaps. This is a very old idea that's very key to some, some really interesting things you can do with uh, Bitcoin. Alice wants to swap some coins with Bob. Now, usually, of course, they're across separate blockchains, otherwise it doesn't really make sense. But the way Alice does this is she creates a secret, unguessable secret, pretty big, and hashes it to X. And then she produces a transaction that says, Bob can spend this output if he produces the thing that hashes to X and his signature. And then Bob goes, okay, Alice, you can spend my transaction with your signature and that thing that hashes to X. Alice, of course, to collect that, spends it by revealing Alice's secret. This is the only thing that will hash to X. That means Bob can see that transaction and now spend Alice's. So without trusting each other, they have managed this swap of coins. Now it turns out with these kind of signature schemes, you can actually set things up with the keys by negotiating between Bob and Alice between themselves. That when Alice collects Bob, signs off to create the signature for Bob's transaction, there's enough information in that for Bob to create the signature he needs to take Alice's transaction. And this is called scriptless scripts. Because on the blockchain, all that appears is Alice says, pay to some key, and Bob says, pay to some key, and then people, people spend those. Nobody but Alice and Bob even knows there was any of this fancy coin swap thing happening. So that definitely helps fungibility and it helps input size. It's a little bit further in the future because people would have to write the infrastructure to use this once we've gotten the soft fork that would introduce new signature schemes. 
Along the line of script improvements, there is a problem with scripts, particularly as they become more powerful. And there are a lot of proposals to add features to Bitcoin to make script a lot more powerful. And that is that it's actually really hard to statically analyze them. It's really hard to make provable statements about what they will do. And we've certainly seen this in the broader community that um, people have a very hard time writing bug-free code. So there is a language called Simplicity. It is a compo type composition language. Um, and if this is the kind of thing is your boat, I really recommend you read the paper. Um, but it's been specifically designed for the blockchain use case. Um, this helps the security of smart contracts by allowing you to do validation. But it's also further in the future. And the reason is that you wouldn't actually write simplicity as it is. You would write some high-level tool that would compile down to simplicity. And those tools are still very much in their infancy. An example of scripts getting more powerful is the idea of covenants. A script today can't really do any kind of sophisticated introspection. In particular, you can't write a script that says, you can spend me if you, you, the transaction that spends me has this kind of output script itself. In particular, you might want to say, OK, you can spend this transaction, but the transaction that spends me has to have an output that says either there's a one-week delay on spending that output, or it can be spent by the emergency key. And this is the base idea behind something called the vault. You would put your money into this kind of output, and then you'd watch the network. And if you see, if you want to take money out of the vault, it takes a week. You spend it, you wait a week. If you see money go out of the vault and you didn't authorize it, that means your private vault key has leaked. At this point, you dig into your backyard, you get out your emergency private key, and you take the funds back. Because remember, the only transaction they were allowed to make that spent this was one that had this one-week delay or the emergency key, and you're holding the emergency key. Enough about scripts for the moment. A blockchain is public. In particular, the amounts are public. And this actually reveals a lot of information. Um, by looking at the amounts, you can often trivially tell which outputs are change output back to the same person and which one's going out. But amounts don't actually technically need to be public. All nodes need to do, know is that there's no inflation. They need to know that the sum of amounts into a transaction is equal to the sum of amounts out of a transaction plus the fees that were paid. They also need to know there's no overflow. You don't want a 1, billion, uh, sorry, 1 million uh, Bitcoin transaction and a minus 1 million Bitcoin transaction, for example. Now, there's a way of doing this using math. Um, it's called confidential transactions. Um, but unfortunately, it takes that 8-byte value and turns it into a 2,500-byte value on the output. And to process each input that spends one of these takes about 14 milliseconds. Now, that's against about 0.1 milliseconds for a normal signature check. So it's very slow and very, very heavy. But there was a paper released a couple of months ago now uh, called Bulletproofs, which cut these numbers down to 4.2 milliseconds and about 650 bytes. Interestingly, that time does actually benefit from batch validation. So if you're doing a batch, you can knock a few, you know, you can actually reduce that somewhat. And also, proofs can be combined across outputs. If you've got eight outputs, it only adds about 200 bytes to the proof. At this point, you're thinking, well, that would incentivize some kind of coin join scheme and everything else. But I still, I still put this in the needs more research phase because it's still a big change. And although uh, the fungibility benefits are huge, uh, I st it's, it's, it's fairly new math. Uh, it would be very, Bitcoin's generally very conservative. And also, there, are, there may be some more things squeezing we can do. Uh, once it goes into blockchain, we're stuck with it. So, you know, go, get it down by another factor of 10 and we'll talk. So, okay. UTXO commitments. Now, this is a very, very old idea in Bitcoin. And the problem is that uh, Lightnode, which doesn't have the whole UTXO set and, and it doesn't track the whole blockchain, can't actually tell whether a transaction is valid. So the idea is that what if we put the UTXO set in every block? Of course, we use our old friend the Merkle tree, we hash it together, and we put that hash root somewhere. This would allow you to prove an unspent output. I can prove it's in there, right? You use our Merkle tree proof, where you provide the hashes for the alternate sides. But you could also prove that a UTXO wasn't in that. If it's ordered, you can prove the two neighbors and see it would be between these two, and these two are right next to each other. So you can prove that a UTXO isn't there. But it would also allow you this kind of thing where you could get the UTXO set, check that it was 
committed to by that block, and so you know it's okay, and work forward from there. So you could do a kind of partial semi-trusted setup. And of course, it would help LightNode security because they could do this kind of checking too. Unfortunately, there are problems with UTXO commitments, especially as I've out naively outlined it here, that put it into the definitely needs more research flying cars kind of phase of the future. But one thing that any kind of UTXO commitment does allow is this UTXO proof idea. The unspent transaction output set, for those of you who weren't following the first slide, currently sits on about 63 million outputs. Now, if everyone on the company, in the world wants to own Bitcoin, that's got to increase to about 7 billion. Internet of Things increased by another factor of 100 or something. So what happens when the UTXO set grows too large for most nodes? What we could do if we had UTXO commitments is nodes would simply remember that Merkle tree. And then when you wanted to spend some Bitcoin, you would provide proof that each of your inputs is in the unspent output set. Well, the downside of this is that wallets would need to be able to track those proofs. That would probably, under most proposals, change in every block. So now you don't just need your private keys and everything else, you also need to actively track the blockchain. And the proofs themselves are reason still reasonably big, say 1K per input. So you're trading bandwidth for UTXO storage. So there are, these are a couple of problems that would probably, um, unless the crisis were acute, we probably wouldn't see it. So it's definitely in the flying cars category. There is a proposal to help with one of the other things we have though with the UTXO set. And that is that validating the UTXO tree is really slow, especially when it gets really big. Um, if you randomly add and delete no leaves, leaves from the tree, um, you end up doing an awful lot of hashing to regenerate the root. Um, and everyone has to do that in order to validate the block as well as to generate it. So the idea of TXO commitments, not UTXO commitments, TXO commitments is you commit every transaction output into the block with a bit that says whether it's spent or not. And you basically build up this Merkle tree. And if you have a Merkle tree where you continue adding data, you actually end up only having to remember a number of peaks. Peter Todd calls this a Merkle mountain range that you build up. And you can just append and append and append. Now he's actually proposing that you would not do this for the current block, but for some previous older block. And you just remember the changes since then. So then the wallet has to prove that its output was in the TXO tree. And in fact, that proof, yes, it is there, gives you enough information to change it from unspent to spent and recalculate the root because you've got all the pairs, the peers. Unfortunately, wallets would still need to track these TXO proofs. And it seems to me that that would almost be as bad, not, perhaps not quite as bad, but it's still something else that they would have to track. And we still have the problem of you've got a, a 1K extra transmission for every input. But it certainly would make, brings the UTXO commitment idea significantly closer. Another idea that goes back even further is this idea of fraud proofs. And this, I, admit, I sort of alluded to this before, light nodes currently, so your mobile phone nodes, uh, stuff like that, generally just trust the miners. If it's in a block, it must be good. This has not proven to always be true. Um, and this goes back to the original Satoshi paper where he said, um, you know, perhaps when network nodes detect an invalid block, they give you an alert, um, and you could download the block and check. Well, that doesn't work. It doesn't work, firstly, because I can alert you all the time and turn you into a full node by forcing you to download every block, and secondly, because you can't validate a block by itself. Without the UTXO set, you, you would have no idea whether or not um, the block is valid. So let's look at what you can compactly prove. Well, if a transaction is completely invalid or malformed, Easy, I hand you the malformed transaction and I Merkle proof that it's in the block and you go, you're right, that block is invalid. If a transaction can't spend the output that it's claiming to spend, kind of the same thing. I provide the proof that the transaction is in and I provide the input transaction, which you can identify by transaction ID and you go, yes, you're right, that can't spend that, great. If its output is already spent, I can also prove that by providing you with the previous, uh, a proof that this previous transaction is in a previous block and therefore you go, yep, you're right, that's been the same thing, done. You cannot, however, currently prove that an input transaction simply doesn't exist if it's, if it's junk. You could do this with a UTXO commitment, though. So if we add soft fork those in, we could do this. Or you could actually have a lighter weight version which just every block says where the inputs came from. And then you display that, prove that, and show that it's wrong. You also can't prove that the fees collected are incorrect. Miners are supposed to add up all the fees from all the transactions and 
give themselves that money? What if they take too much? There is a kind of Merkle tree which adds a sum in there, and with the sum of Merkle tree, you can in fact prove this. So we could soft fork that and it would work. But what if the Merkle hash is completely wrong? Just junk. In general, you can't prove this. And in fact, this is a subset of a problem called a data withholding attack. I know it's called that because I named it when I was writing the slides. And in this, you basically, a miner puts out an, a, a, a new block, but doesn't provide any of the transactions that were in it. Lightweight nodes go, the block looks fine. Full nodes go, I don't trust this block because I don't have enough information to validate it, but I can't produce a proof of that to help the light nodes. Now, there's a whole heap of speculation over providing nodes over fountain codes in such a way that you are required to reveal all the information, which is definitely puts this in the realm of the flying cars, much, much more research needed if we were to go this direction. And that is the last of the consensus changes, the soft fork changes. Now I'm going to talk about peer protocol changes. I think I have time for, nope. OK, TXO bit fields. This is a different approach to the whole problem of UTXO set becomes far too large. In this, each node remembers a bit field for each block and one bit for every transaction output. Is it spent or not? And it remembers a root Merkle for that block. And then the node sends a Merkle proof that proves this transaction, I'm try transaction output I'm trying to spend is the 3,000th output in the block. So the full node then checks that proof is correct. Yes, you are bit 3,000, and then checks bit 3,000. Is it spent or not? And flips it if necessary. Now this works because the size of UTXO, an unspent output, is around about 32 bytes, sometimes bigger, sometimes smaller. Whereas the size of the TXO bit field, which is not for every unspent transaction, but is for every transaction ever, is only one bit. Now it turns out the ratio between UTXO and TXO is only about 12.6. Um, so we still end up with a data structure that's about 20 times smaller. And in fact, if that bit field becomes incredibly sparse because most things are spent, there are ways of compressing it further to make it more dense. Now the cool thing about this is, yes, proof size is still an issue, you still have to send these proofs along, but the proof of TXO position is static. Once the block is set, you can create the proof and that's all you need to know. It doesn't update like the UTXO set proofs do. And this is also not a consensus change. Nothing has to go in the block. This is just peers could choose to start insisting on these proofs themselves for scalability, perhaps only for very old outputs. So I think this is really interesting, but as far as I know, no one's actively working on it. So I'm still putting it in the sort of, you know, further future. Another subset of the UTXO problem is simply the fact that there is no compact way to prove a UTXO set is correct. It turns out that XORing, them, XORing all the UTXOs in together is not secure. So there's this idea of a rolling UTXO set hash. So you can update this 256-bit number um, it's fairly easy to calculate. And when a new block comes in, you can just update this one hash. Now what that gives you is a couple of things. If you're a full node, you can record your UTXO set hash, and then you can validate that your UTXO set hasn't been corrupted. But it also provides, again, this idea of initial boom node bootstrap. If you get UTXO hash from somebody you trust, say the person providing you with the Bitcoin software, then you can go anywhere and get the UTXO set, check that it's valid and go, great, I don't need to go check those old nodes. I'm going to assume they were correct at this point and work my way forwards. And that may be, if, if things keep getting bigger, somewhere that Bitcoin has to go for at least a, a middle ground between a full node and a light node. We have still the problem that transactions are too large. You heard me allude to the fact that we're bumping 170 gig at the moment for the blockchain. But it turns out that you can compress transactions with a dedicated compressor by about 28%. Still to do benchmarks on how fast decompression is, but that is just trans compressing the transactions in isolation, not with any context. And that would obviously help both bandwidth and storage. But in fact, most of the bandwidth used by full nodes today is not sending blocks. It's just announcing that you have a transaction ID. It's very, very chatty like that. We broadcast it to all. What we could do instead is just announce it to one or two peers and then use set reconciliation every so often to 
uh, to, to catch any ones that you've missed. And we know how to do set reconciliation very efficiently. So that would be much more efficient than the current blast. And that obviously would help bandwidth of full nodes. But again, I don't know of anyone who's working on it, so I'll push that back. I said before that block propagation was fairly efficient, but it still takes about 40k to send a block. And this is because of something called compact blocks. Compact blocks basically sends a summary of what's in the block, assuming that you've seen most of these transactions before. And it has two nodes. It has a high bandwidth mode and a low bandwidth mode. In high bandwidth mode, you, I basically just send you the summary. Every time I get a block, I just blast the whole summary to you. 40k, it's not that expensive. For low bandwidth mode, I tell you, by the way, I've got this block, and then you request it, and then I send you the summary. So there's another round trip in low bandwidth mode. Now, Bitcoin Core, by default, picks three peers to be high bandwidth peers, and everyone else to be low bandwidth peers. And the three that are high bandwidth peers are the last three that gave us a block, because they're probably pretty well connected. So the idea with block template delta compression is every 30 seconds, we take those three peers, and we send them a template. Here's what we expect to be in the next block. And then when an actual block comes in, we just send a delta against the template that we sent. And it turns out that about 22% of the time, that delta is under one packet, which of course is the golden point for low latency. And that particularly helps if you're doing something crazy like trying to do Bitcoin mining over satellite. Another problem with fungibility on the network is that today there are a lot of nodes that connect to as many nodes as they can and look for transactions. But they're trying to figure out where transactions originate in order to de-anonymize the network. Um, I ban a whole heap of them from my nodes, for example. The dandelion uh, algorithm is, is, a, is an attempted solution to this. And what it does is, when it gets a transaction, and you can see the red there, it exposes it to a single peer 90% of the time. And then on the 10% case, it broadcasts it to everyone. Hence the dandelion. So these are the stem phase and the fluff phase. There are a couple of additional rules that you have to add to really make this work and make it robust. Um, but this is something that I hope to see in the, the sooner rather than later, because it really does help fungibility on the network. Another problem that helps fungibility on the network is this proposal called Neutrino. Um, the current way light nodes work is they tell the full nodes a bloom filter. Here's all the stuff I'm interested in. And that works about as well for privacy as you might expect. Once you've seen one of those addresses, it is almost trivial to figure out which peer it was that is interested in that, i.e., who's got that in their wallet. It also requires every node to look through those bloom filters and do the calculations every time a block comes in as to whether or not to send the uh, transaction to that peer, or every time a transaction comes in. Neutrino inverts this. The full nodes produce a block summary. It ends up to be about 20K. Um, and the algorithm to use this is really awesome, and I went down a complete rabbit hole looking into it um, that, had, that has absolutely nothing to do with blockchain. Um, but this summary allows the light nodes then to go, this looks like a block I'm interested in, and then it can pull down the whole block. Ideally from a separate peer, so there's not even any correlation between the two. Now this would definitely help light node privacy, but the reason I push it back from 2019 to uh, perhaps a few years further is that the uh, originator of this, um, roast beef or Lalu, uh, is actually deep into lightning development as well, and so um, I expect that to consume all his cycles for some years to come. We have another problem on the network. A number of years ago, we introduced prune nodes. Prune nodes download every block, but they throw away old ones. It saves a lot of space. It's awesome. It's still a full node. It's just throwing away stuff it doesn't need. But there's a bit in the service bit when you advertise a node that says that you will serve all blocks. They don't set this because they can't. And there's a proposal to add a, actually a couple of separate bits that say, actually, I do have the last 500 or 10,000 blocks. And this will really help reduce the current bandwidth load on the existing full archival nodes that are not pruned. I expect that very soon. It also might interest you that we don't actually encrypt or authenticate traffic between Bitcoin nodes. It is, to some extent, public information. But as we've seen, there are a number of analysis attacks against this. Um, and so. It's, it's a fairly low-hanging fruit in order to do um, against passive attacks. But it also helps the case where you've got a trusted node. If you're running a light node and you connect to a dedicated full node, um, it's a much more secure arrangement. But there's no out-of-box solution to authenticate nodes. So that would help. Now there are a whole heap of things that I wanted to mention. 
And I put them on this slide to make myself feel better. Um, but I'm not going to mention any of them. I do promise that I will tweet out the list with all the references uh, and summaries of all this stuff once I polish it up into shape. Um, it's currently a Google Doc. And if there are any questions, I would be delighted to answer them. Come on, that wasn't so hard. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Thanks, Little Rusty. Uh, what do your hats say? Oh, sorry, you can't see the hat. Um, this one says, someone in Bitcoin did something awesome, again. And this one says, someone in Bitcoin did something stupid, again. <laughs> Anthony Town suggested that the pair of this covers every occasion in Bitcoin. <laughs> Yeah, Rusty, I was just uh, wanting to know what you're currently working on. Is it one of those issues? No, I am working on none of these. Um, I am actually working on Lightning, um, which is incredibly exciting. And I've been working on it for over two and a half years. And we've, we are approaching the stage when it's actually soon going to be usable by normal um, people without, <laughs> without definitely losing money. Um, so it's an incredibly exciting time. Uh, but my timing is terrible, so I'm here talking about not that. Rusty, there's somewhat of a question on Twitter, which is, uh, please prove to us that you are not the output of an AI-powered fake blockchain talk transaction. OK. Um, I anticipated this question, and I'm glad it was asked. <laughs> I don't believe such a proof is possible. <laughs> or is he just saying that? Next. Hi, Rusty. Um, on the Dandelion project, uh, do you think uh, it could potentially hinder the ability to monitor the network for any nodes that are doing anything dodgy? So, I mean, any level of, so, so Dandelion itself, not particularly. I mean, so, so Dandelion basically has this, this stem and fluff approach. So it generally, the, the idea is that the transaction will travel some way before it, it, it sort of broads out, cars out to the network, not necessarily the original point. Um, there is a timer built in there, so basically once it sends, if it sends it down a dead end, it will just fluff it out anyway. Um, and they've got really good numbers in the paper on basically analyzing what percentage of nodes basically need to be evil before this scheme is compromised. Um, and the numbers are pretty reassuring. So um, I, think it, I think it will be quite good. It is actually in general hard to monitor the entire Bitcoin network. Um, and that is kind of a feature in a way. Uh, but I don't think this, this will be the main, main issue. I was shocked once, by the way, to see a block explorer pinpoint a transaction that I sent from my, you know, my tip jar address to Adelaide. And that was a little bit eye-opening for me. We have time for one last question over here. Rusty, you made a, an intriguing comment on one of your randomly generated slides that said that people we're trying to de-anonymize the network. Do you have any speculations as to what kind of entities those people may be? Uh, so who's trying to de-anonymize the network? There, there are companies, so chain analysis companies, who this is their job. They do chain analysis, right? And they try to de-anonymize Bitcoin transactions. Why? Um, the main, uh, at this point, I, I completely say out of that world. But um, uh, I believe they are trying to sell the information to places that have KYC AML requirements so that they can then say, oh, this person is dodgy, therefore you need to stop accepting their Bitcoin or whatever. KYC people don't know that term. Uh, sorry, um, know your customer rules. So, so anti-money laundering, know your customer rules, which basically say that you need to know what people are doing, um, sometimes conflicts with an anonymous peer-to-peer -peer cash system. So um, <laughs> uh, I suspect it's, it, many of them are just companies that are basically trying to sell that information to others. Um, who are actively doing the the network. They're generally not that clever, um, but it's still a bit of an arms race. And it's something that you know, we obviously uh, need to keep on top of. Rusty, thank you so much. That was a force majeure, majeure <laughs> little presentation of uh, the state of blockchain. Here's a gift of gratitude from everyone and the organizers. Let's give a round of applause to Rusty. Thank you.
And will you stick around the conference? Yeah, yeah, I will certainly be around for the rest of the conference, and I'll be there for beers tonight to answer questions. All right. Thank you very much. I believe that's it for the day. And uh, we have the penguin dinner tonight. And as far as I know, the uh, people start walking in groups from 5.30 behind building one in the green space, the uh, outside green space under the blue space.